रिकॉर्डिंग इशू है राजस्थान वी कैन स्टार्ट या 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 सो गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी सो थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग ऑन दिस इनवाइटेड लेक्चर सीरीज by the north zone in uh, indian society of nephrology for the first talk we have dr muttu kumar from new york and uh, this session would be moderated by professor dipankar bomik from all india institute of medical science new delhi and dr madhu from new york so uh, professor bomik and dr madhu all yours please yeah thank you thank you raja i think it's a great initiative on your part Uh, so that in all zone is organizing one uh, nice uh, webinar and the topic is very important that is the gsa renal transplant a very uh, important topic and uh, of great clinical value so it's real pleasure to have uh, dr muthu kumar who we have heard a lot and it's nice meeting you at least online so the floor is yours i think uh, you can start your talk dr muthu you can say a few a few words uh, regarding his uh, current position Good evening to all from New York. It's actually a very warm, sunny spring morning here. Um, and uh, if you see Dr. Motukumar's first slide, it really looks like a live camp from New York today with its bright appearance of New York City. Um, I want to uh, really congratulate the uh, the new office bearers of uh, North Zone Indian Society of Nephrology for taking this initiative and energizing. Uh, the society by uh, starting a very dynamic academic programs i'm really grateful to be part of this program today and i'm even more grateful that you call my knowledgeable and uh, a wonderful friend from uh, all the way from chandigarh now in new york as well dr tangamani muthukumar uh, with whom every conversation uh, gives me a lot of pearls of knowledge and wisdom uh, which i always look forward to like all of you today and uh, i am so happy to be here and uh, happy to be listening to dr muthu kumar along with you thank you thank you madhu uh, thank you dr bomek uh, good evening everyone thank you dr raja ramachandran for uh, providing me this opportunity it's really an honor to be here today the topic that i am going to discuss today is testing for donor specific antibodies in kidney transplantation i hope my slide is visible Yes, yes. Nice. Okay. Good. Are you audible? Very clear. Okay. So let's start with the question: What is the cross match test? Now, cross match test is an immunological is a test to assess the immunological risk of a recipient with a potential donor. The first recorded cross match was not for kidney transplant, but for blood transfusion, as early as 1908 in New York City. the first successful kidney transplant we are all aware was done in 1954 but here cross match was not an issue because it was done between identical twins paul terasaki in 1964 proposed for the first time in a patient that pre existing antibodies could have been the cause for immediate graft dysfunction and in 1969 this famous new england journal paper was published where you can see that patients who had antibodies against random donors when they underwent cross match where recipient and donor risk assessment was done patients who had positive cross match 80% of them had or the other way around patients who lost the graft 80% of them had a positive cross match so this test became a gold standard since 1969 and after that all kidney transplants cross match has become mandatory to make sure that there is no immediate graft dysfunction so when we say immediate graft dysfunction and we are doing a cross match the next question is what are the major antibodies that are relevant in transplantation the major antibodies that are relevant are antibodies against abo blood group antigen and antibodies against human leukocyte antigen which are called as allo antigens now what about blood group antigen we are talking about we are not we are transplanting only the kidney not the blood it's not a blood transfusion but then why are we talking about abo blood group antigen it's because of the fact that though these are called blood group antigens 
the antigens of the ABO system are present in every cell in the body, especially more in the endothelial cell. And we all have antibodies against the blood group that we do not express. So these isoantibodies can cause immediate graft dysfunction if ABO incompatibility is there. RH antigen or the RH system is not present on endothelial cells, so RH typing is not needed. Now, antibodies against human leukocyte antigen are called alloantigen, and this is the one that makes us as us. If I am Muthukumar, I am recognized as Muthukumar by my own antigen system, HLA antigen system, and if any HLA that does not belong to me, my body perceives that as foreign. These are called allo because antigens in the same species are known as allo. Let's say that we cross the barrier and when we go for xenotransplants, we all have natural antibodies against animal antigens and those are known as xenoantibodies. So allo antigen or allo antibodies are the antibodies that are present in the same species, but that differentiate one individual from an other individual. So what are these allo antigens that we are dealing with? The allo antigens are HLA, our human leukocyte antigen. These are cell surface glycoproteins. Interestingly, these are the most or the highly polymorphic antigens that are known. There are more than 20,000 HLA class one allele expressed on all nucleated cells. There are more than 8,000 class two alleles expressed on professional antigen presenting cells. By professional antigen presenting cells, we generally talk about three major types of cells, B cells, dendritic cells, and macrophages. And in certain situations, class two antigens are also expressed on endothelial cells when endothelial cells are acting as antigen presenting cells. There are three major class one genes, HLA, A, B, and C. There are three major class two genes, DP, DQ, DR. Now, HLA class two is a little more complicated than class one. In DP, we have an alpha chain and a beta chain. In DQ, we have an alpha chain and a beta chain. In DR, we have an alpha chain and four beta chains that are encoded by DRB1, B3, B4, B5. To make things more complicated, in DR, though there are though there is one alpha chain and four beta chains, there are only three possible for an individual. A maximum of two from DRB1 can be associated with a maximum of two of DRB3, B4, and B5. So this is the allo antigens, the class one and the class two antigens that we are dealing with. So is HLA nomenclature that complicated? Unfortunately, yes. Now this cartoon here shows the current naming convention for HLA. You will see that HLA hyphen A, there is an asterisk. In this example, I have provided there is a 02 colon 101 colon 01 colon 02 followed by N. The, the A there is the locus, which is the gene name. And the numbers 02, 101, 01, and 02 are different fields. There are four fields, field one, field two, field three, and field four. At the end, you have several alphabets. Here, what is shown in this example is N, and that's a suffix there. Now, this field one is this allele group or an antigen, and field two is specific HLA protein. Let's not go into field three and field four today. For now, let's restrict to field one and field two. Now field one, when we do a conventional serological typing in olden days, HLA is like blood group antigens, HLA is determined by serology. So when we do serological typing, we write that as HLA A2. By DNA typing, this naming convention is, comes with an asterisk. So you have DNA typing HLA A, uh, zero to asterisk and a zero to. Field two are different proteins, but that do not react with each other in serological test. For example, if we say A2101 and A2102, they are different proteins, 
but do not react with each other in serological tests. So currently in US, HLA typing needs to be done by DNA typing methodology. There are three levels at which the HLA typing can be done, a low resolution, high resolution, and an allelic level resolution. Low resolutions are serological equivalents. In other words, if it is restricted to field one, if my laboratory simply reports the HLA typing as HLA A02 by DNA, that's called low resolution typing. When it reports to a level of field two, say I report a patient's HLA as HLA A02 colon 101, then that's called a high resolution typing. And if the all four fields are reported, then that's called an allelic resolution typing. Okay, now which part of the HLA is seen by an antibody? So let's say I have an antibody against HLA. HLA is a big structure. So which part of the HLA is seen by the antibody? Now on the left, you will see a cartoon of an immunoglobulin molecule. We all know that immunoglobulin is typically represented as a Y-shaped structure where we have a light chain and a heavy chain and a stock region, which is known as the FC portion and the two branches of the Y, which, call, which we call the FAV portion. Are you able to see my pointer when I move the mouse? Yes, yes. yes. we can see okay. it. Okay. So if this is the immunoglobulin or the antibody structure, this is a simple cartoon, but in this tip where the antigen binds, you have a finger-like structure. And this is known as complementarity determining region or CDR loops. There are six CDR loops, three light and three heavy, L1, L2, L3, and H1, H2, and H3. So when an antigen binds, to this finger-like structure, it's as if holding the antigen in both our hands. So this is the configuration or the three-dimensional configuration when an antigen is binding to an antibody. So going back, if this is an immunoglobulin, it can be an antibody against anything. So this is a simple cartoon provided as a Y-shaped structure, but when an antigen binds, it takes the form of our hands holding on to the antigen. So these six regions are recognizing the antigen. Now let's go to the HLA molecule. On the right side, this is your HLA class one molecule that has an alpha one, alpha two, and an alpha three together and an unconnected beta two microglobulin chain. And HLA two class two molecule has an alpha one, alpha two, and a beta one, beta two. This is the peptide, by, the peptide that binds. So more or less, there is structural similarity between this class one, class two molecule and the immunoglobulin structure. Now, on the right, you have a cartoon, which is a three-dimensional model where the blue is the beta two microglobulin. This pink is the HLA molecule, and this green is the peptide. So, this L1, L2, L3, H1, H2, H3, these are the portions of the antibody that are, I mean, portions of the antigen that are seen by the antibody. So this portion is known as epitope. So epitope is part of the antigen that's recognized by the antibody. Remember, when we say HLA, it's a huge structure. When we say anti-HLA antibodies or antibodies are formed against HLA, it is not forming against the entire portion of the HLA, but a specific portion of the HLA known as epitope. So the part of the antigen recognized by the antibody. Historically, it was appreciated that antibodies developed after exposure to a single allo HLA reacted with certain other allo HLAs as well. These cross-reactive groups share epitopes. What does it mean? So to make our lives more complicated, though we name HLA as HLA A2, A4, A6 like that, epitopes can be shared across different HLAs and these are called as cross-reactive groups. Now, within an epitope, let's say this is an epitope, 
look at this H3. This H3 portion is an applet here. What is an applet? A center cluster of about two to five amino acids that determine the binding specificity of an antibody. So at the end of the day, HLA may be a huge structure. You can form an antibody against HLA, but what determines one particular antibody from another particular antibody is just two to five amino acids. So this two to five amino acids that is in the center of the epitope is known as applet, and these determine the binding specificity of an antibody. If a donor and recipient HLA share an epitope, then that epitope will not be recognized as foreign and therefore will not provoke an antibody response. In other words, at a serological level, I may have an antibody against the against HLA-A2. But if that HLA-A2 or whatever the HLA that we are dealing with has multiple applets, and if the applets are matching, then these antibodies are not reacting against that applet and these patients can be trans transplanted. So these days, there is there are certain programs that try to match at an applet level rather than at the entire HLA level. And in future, probably there will be more programs that start routine mapping of applets and there will be applet level matching. Okay, so now, so far we learned about what is, what are the allo antibodies that, what are the, what is the allo antigen that we are dealing with? When we say there is an antibody against HLA, what portion of the anti antigen is being recognized. Now, let's move on to what are the different cross-match tests that's routinely being used. At the first level that we are all familiar with is the CDC cross-match, which tests the functional potential of complement fixing antibodies in recipient circulation, which can immediately bind to and react against the donor antigen. In other words, if I'm getting a kidney transplant and somebody gives me a kidney, antibodies in my serum are reacted against donor lymphocytes. So this is the, the output of the test is cell death, the death of the donor lymphocytes. Now this is in a way a surrogate for what is going to happen if a kidney is transplanted in me. So I have preformed antibodies and that are going to attack this kidney. So instead of, I cannot simply test my serum to the kidney that I'm going to get in a test tube. So as a surrogate, we get lymphocytes from the donor instead of the kidney, and my serum is being reacted against the lymphocytes. So this is a functional potential of complement fixing antibodies. At the next level is the flow cytometric cross match, which is not a functional test, but identifies antibodies directed at cell surface antigens. Now, whereas CDC crossmatch or complement dependent cellular cytotoxicity crossmatch uses a functional readout of cell lysis. In the flow cytometry crossmatch, only the binding of HLA specific antibodies is detected, regardless of their complement fixing or pathogenic potential. Now, there is, in addition to CDC and flow crossmatch, which are known as physical crossmatches, there is something known as virtual crossmatch. Virtual crossmatch is an assessment of immunological compatibility based on patient's allo antibody profile compared with donor's histocompatibility antigen. So the virtual crossmatch uses the results of two independently done physical, independently done physical laboratory tests and does not involve mixing of serum and cells. So in physical crossmatch, both CDC and flow cytometry, you need my serum and the donor lymphocytes. Whereas virtual cross match, these are done independently and does not involve mixing of serum and cells. Instead, immune compatibility is assessed by analyzing the results of donor HLA typing that was done separately and patient antibodies against HLA that is done separately. Okay, so we, I just told that HLA antibodies are bad, and these are the allo antibodies that are creating problems. So why do some individuals develop anti-HLA antibodies? Now, I just told before that we all have blood group, naturally occurring blood group antibodies 
to the blood group antigens that we do not express. So if I'm B blood group, I have B blood group antigens that are being expressed on my cells and I have naturally occurring antibodies against blood group A. Like that, do we all have antibodies against HLA that we do not express? No. Human beings do not, there are no naturally occurring anti-HLA antibodies. So I put that statement in red and that is an asterisk here. Why is there an asterisk? I'll come back to that in a couple of slides. So for now, let's assume that there are no naturally occurring anti-HLA antibodies. So you need sensitizing events to develop anti-HLA antibodies. The common sensitizing events are prior blood transfusion, pregnancy, and a prior organ transplantation. Okay, now, how do we detect anti-HLA antibodies? We currently, the technology used to detect anti-HLA antibodies is a solid phase assay. Solid phase assay is our reactions where one component of the assay, either the antigen or antibody, is sort of coated or it is caught in a solid surface like a test tube or a bead and the other component, either the antigen or antibody is free to remain in the fluid phase and act. So a platform that is commonly used for this solid phase assay is the one that's developed by Luminex Corporation. It works on the principles of flow cytometry and it is conventionally called as a Luminex test. This is basically a bead-based multiplexed immunoassay that combines proprietary microsphere technology with fluidics, optics, and digital signal processing. So what is this microsphere technology? You will see on the right, this cartoon. Imagine there are 100 different beads. Each bead is coated with two different colors. And by shining two different lasers, you are able to identify what bead you are dealing with. So in a way, this is simply a multiplexed assay where in a small amount of sample, you are able to detect multiple antigens. Now, remember that this technology that developed by Luminex Corporation, this platform used, what is known as Luminex test, has nothing to do with HLA. It is simply a flow cytometry. It's simply a test that is based on the principles of flow cytometry, where you have beads, 100 beads, each, beads, each bead is being identified as a particular bead. It's each bead is given an identity number. So in other words, by using laser signaling, you'll be able to say that, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting light signals from bead number 21. I'm getting signal from bead number, 20, uh, bead number 26, so on and so forth. Now, in this technology, based on these beads, you can create whatever or you can code whatever antigen you want on these beads. So example, if I want to look at cytokines, I can code antibodies against here and then in, in each bead and then use the blood sample or serum sample to get the information on cytokines. So how does this bead or what is the output of this bead? So the single antigen bead output is reported as a mean or median fluorescence intensity value or MFI value. This MFI value is a semi-quantitative assessment that does not reflect accurately the concentration or titer of the antibody, but gives beads relative fluorescence without reference to a static. Now, this is very important to be clear that this is not in a linear scale. What does it mean? If I report that the MFI value for an antibody is 2000, and if I report for another patient that this is 4,000, this is not equivalent to saying that there is twice the amount of antibodies that is present. So this is a relative standard and this is not an absolute quantity. And above all, this is not a linear scale. Okay, so now we learned Luminex platform and the Luminex speed. Now, how do we detect this anti-HLA antibodies? Now, using this technology, of this Luminex platform, two companies, one known as LabScreen and another one is known as LifeCode, they created assays to detect HLA. So how was this assay created? So if this is a Luminex bead, you generate a synthetic HLA on this Luminex bead. And 
this bead with this coated HLA is added or serum samples are added to this. Now, let's say that my this is A2 and my serum sample is added and I have an A2 antibody. My A2 antibody points to this HLA A2. Then a deduction antibody is added and when the excess amount is washed, if there is antibody A2 binding to HLA A2, then this deduction antibody that is bound to my HLA A2 antibody is picked up as fluorescent signal. So this deduction antibody has a fluorescent label or a fluorescent conjugated antibody. This signal is picked up and reported as an MFI mean or a median fluorescent intensity values. Now, routinely these days, what's used is a single antigen bead in which each luminex bead is coated with one particular antigen. So if it is A2, there is, it's one bead. If it is, say, B27, it's another bead. So each antigen is expressing only one HLA. Each bead is expressing only one HLA antigen. Now, where are these antigens coming from? The antigen source for the single antigen B is recombinant cell lines. Now, when we use a recombinant cell line, there is a problem. What is the problem? Now, this cartoon is a structure of HLA class 1 molecule. You have alpha 1 or the A1, A2, A3, and then a beta 2 microglobulin chain. Plus, you have a peptide. So, all these three the HLA molecule, the beta-2 microglobulin, and the peptide together constitutes the antigen. Now, when it's derived from recombinant cell line and coated on the HLA beads, this is denatured. So you don't have this entire structure going on beads, but you can have various combinations. Either you can have the alpha chain alone with the peptide dimer, or you can have an alpha chain and a beta-2 microglobulin dimer without a peptide, or you can have an alpha chain only. So in other words, though the single antigen beads are sensitive in the sense that you are able to detect antibodies against HLA of interest, we need to remember that this HLA molecule that's expressed on the single antigen beads do not resemble what is happening in cells because of the change in the configuration during the process of generating this antigen. Now, I said human beings do not have naturally occurring anti-HLA antibodies, and I put an asterisk there. So why is this asterisk? Now, single antigen bead assays, once they became popular, it was observed that there were presence of antibodies to HLA in humans in healthy males not immunized to HLA. So though we say that human beings should not have HLAs against anti -H naturally occurring HLA antibodies, once with the advent of single antigen beads, the such HLA, molecule, HLA antibodies were identified. Where are they coming from? These are probably cross-reactive epitopes in microorganisms, ingested proteins and allergens, but not against an intact HLA. So in vivo, they are not creating any problems or they, they generally do not create any problems because in the process of HLA molecule synthesis on a bead, you, because of the change in the architecture that I just, just described in the previous slide, you're exposing cryptic neoantigens. So, so far, so good. So you know that this cryptic neoantigens, there are these antibodies reacting in vivo this cryptic are hidden. So there is, there is no way these antibodies are going to react to the antigens. So it's not a big deal. But this, this can be problem because though in, in vivo such antigens are not normally accessible to these antibodies, when a test is reported as positive to finalize the cross-match results or the finalize the virtual cross-match result that whether somebody has a real antigen or this is all because of exposure to this cryptic antigens becomes a challenge. One way to overcome this problem is of one protocol that's developed is this acid treatment of beads. When you treat the beads with acid, what happens is that further denatures HLA, creates more cryptic antigens, 
and there is increased MFI value of antibodies. So when you suspect some antibodies are not real, but are in the context of cryptic antigens or due to the presence of HLA antigens that have been altered during the process of bead generation, then one can use an acid treatment to see if the MFA value is increasing, in which case you are confident in telling that these are not antigens that are going to create problems in vivo. So, so far we dealt with single antigen bead antibodies detected in single antigen bead. Now, what is a donor specific antibody? When the single antigen bead assay detects the presence of antibodies that are directed against donor HLA, then these are called donor specific antibodies, simple. Let's give an example. A patient who is being evaluated for a kidney transplant may have circulating antibodies detected by single antigen bead against A2, against multiple other antigen specificities. If this patient's prospective donor has HLA A2 expressed on his or her kidney and every other cell, then this antibody against HLA A2 is called a donor specific antibody. Remember that though used generically, the term DSA as detected in most laboratories implies anti HLA IgG antibodies. Let's go over this one more time. Though we call this as donor specific antibody, for all practical purposes, donor specific antibodies is anti HLA IgG antibodies. What about IgM? They are not detected by the conventional Luminex instruments that most of the laboratories use. What about non HLA? No, we can test for non HLA. But the term DSA that's routinely used implies antibodies against HLA. What antibodies? Only IgG. Now, how is the single antigen bead assay reported? Now, this is an, a report from our own laboratory. Now, I'll draw your attention to a couple of things here. Now, if you see my pointer here, this is the individual self. Let's say it's me. I'm getting this is my HLA profile. This is a disease donor. This is disease donor HLA profile. Now, what is reported here is DQ7. Now let's go to the, so this DQ7 is the disease donor's HLA phenotype. Forget the other antigens for a moment. So just focus on DQ7. I'm DQ2, my donor, my prospective donor is DQ7. Now, what is reported here is your single antigen bead assay. On the left is class two antibody results, DR, DQ, and on the right is class one antibody results, A, B, and C. Now I have shown in red here, DQ7s. So in the single antigen bead assay that's done, there are five different beads that are DQ7. That's what is shown here, DQ7, one, two, three, four, five. So what is shown here is the MFI values. You will see that, for these three, for the first two DQs, there is one MFA value of 6325, another one is 6000. For the third DQ, seven is 2500. And the fourth, it's 925. And for the fifth, it is 635. So they took my blood sample. I am going to, I am the transplant, the prospective transplant recipient waiting for a kidney. They took my blood sample, put it in the Luminex machine. And then the output is reported as Mutu has antibodies against DQ7. But do I have an antibody against DQ7 that this patient, this my prospective recipient, my prospective donor has? Because there are five DQ7s. So that's where you look for the next level, or if you see the field two of HLA. Now, there is no mandate yet in the US that HLA phenotyping has to be reported at the, at the field two level. But most of the laboratories try to do that. Say for this patient, for example, donor high resolution HLA typing was available. And that donor's HLA typing was not just DQ7, that's your field one, but at the next level, it was DQ319. Now, if you see here, Go back. 
you will see here that this TQ7 of the five beats, one beat that is in bold here is DQB1390. So against that HLA, there is 6018 MFI antibody. So that 6018 is reported here. Let's go over this one more time. I am the prospect, I am waiting for a kidney. My HLA is two, DQ2. I get a donor and that donor's HLA is DQ7. But my HLA antibody is reported as DQ7 positive. So how do I know whether which subtype of DQ7 that the donor has or which subtype of DQ7 do I form antibodies? That's where this high resolution typing comes in. It turns out that the donor is this 0392 and the antibody against that that I have in me is 6000 MFI. Let's say that instead of this 319, the donor has 301. So if you look at 301, it is only 635, which is below the cutoff. I will come back to that cutoff later. So it is below the cutoff. And then my report is denoted as negative, no antibodies against HLA DQ P301. So, and then I go ahead with the transplant. So if you don't go to the second field level and then just stop here, I cannot be getting this kidney because I have antibodies against HLA D7. So that is where your field two level is helpful, where when you have an antibody that is directed by single antigen beta say, you need to determine whether which subtype or which level or field two specificity that this antibody is directed against. Okay, so, so far I said, there is a technology available. It's very sophisticated. You look antibodies, you know what the antigen profile of a donor is, and then you are matching or not matching and saying that this patient is ready to get this kidney or not ready to get this kidney. Seems so intuitive and straightforward. So what's the big deal? The big deal is that there are multiple challenges in defining the presence or absence of circulating antibodies against HLA. Absence of antibody is not equivalent to evidence for absence. What does it mean? A false negative DSA, DSA that's present but reported as negative in the single antigen beta say. There can be several issues why there is false negatives. There is no beats for a particular specificity. I may be having antibodies against HLA A2, but if the bead set that I'm using has no HLA A2 that is coded on the bead, then this antigen is not, this antibody is not picked up. So this is so there is lot to lot variability in manufacturing. HLA structure differs between the vendors. So I said there are two vendors. And when I said the HLA structure is denatured during the process of sample, during the process of bead preparation. There is a variability in the way the structures are, the HLA structure is there on the bead between the two vendors. And then we discuss shared epitopes where antibody targets that are shared by multiple antigens on the panel tested may result in dilution of the antibodies that bind to each antigen. So multiple beads have the same shared episodes. My antibody that is in the serum is diluted out. So in vitro, it is reported as low level for each bead. Similarly, inhibitory factors that are present in the patient's serum, such as complement C1Q, may interfere with antibody detection. And this, this is known as prozone effect and require pretreatment of the serum with heat, DTT, or EDTA, or dilution of the serum. So does this mean now, so we discussed about DSA negative, but DSA positive equals clinically significant antibody. Is that correct? Again, there is no easy answer for that. When to call an antibody as, as present or positive or as absent or negative. Unlike the routine standard laboratory test like serum creatinine or blood glucose, the way HLAs, the HLA antibodies are assessed, those tests are not standardized. 
So at what MFI value to call a test as positive is not standardized and different laboratories use different approaches. Most of them use a statistical approach, meaning that fluorescent level above a background. There can be a practical cut point as well, where you can simply try to correlate the MFA value with a physical cross-match result or a clinical cut point where correlate with rejection or grad failure. Our laboratory at New York here uses 2000 MFI to call an antibody as positive or negative, but studies have shown that anywhere around 1000 to 1500 yield a high level of agreement among laboratories. If laboratories report virtual cross match as positive, whenever DSA is positive, then virtual cross match is potentially more sensitive than physical cross match, meaning that Whenever a DSA is reported as positive, you call them as virtual cross match positive. Then you are picking up a group of individuals who are negative by CDC or by flow, but they are positive by virtual cross match. So, in other words, this boils down to the question that my DSA is positive, but my flow and cross uh, CDC is negative. What do I do? So strategies used by laboratories to determine the specificity of antibodies is based on the sensitization history, knowledge of cross-reactive groups, epitope analysis, and refinement to the single antigen bead assay, such as serial dilution of the serum. So there is DSA positive prior to transplant. Now what? So when there is positive, so once there is DSA positive and say a physical cross match is positive, flow or CDC is positive, depending on individual centers risk taking policy, how much they are comfortable with in dealing with immunological risk, one can decide not to transplant or try to do desensitization protocol before transplant or going for a pad donor exchange. Now, if DSA is positive and the negative cross match. This is what I said in the earlier slide, where I said if laboratories are reporting as positive DSA and the physical cross match is going to be negative, then you will have a group of people where there will be DSA positive prior to transplant, a low level positivity, but cross match is negative. So there, usually these patients do well and one may proceed with transplant. Now, let's go to the opposite scenario. DSA is negative, but cross match is positive. So you do a CDC positive, flow cytometry cross match positive, DSA is completely negative. Now what? Now, my chief here, Dr. Sudantaran, he has an algorithm. We call it Sudantaran algorithm, AAA. First, he stands for defined donor allele. So first, make sure that the donor HLA typing is done adequately, add to a field two level so that the donor phenotype is clear. Next A stands for check whether the donor allele is present in the single antigen B. In other words, I'm reporting DSA as negative because I simply don't have that particular antigen B. So then even though I may have antibody in my system or my circulation, my antigen is not, my bead is not simply picking up. Finally, check for autoantibodies, especially patients with lupus, they have plenty of autoantibodies. So all these, whenever you have a situation where DSA is negative, but cross match is positive, it's better to run an autoantibody where my own cells are allowed to react with my serum. So if my autoantibody values, say in a flow, if my autoantibody is positive and it is similar to alloantibody positivity, then it's probably all autoantibody that's causing this signal and one can go ahead. So in USA, laboratories must determine HLA phenotyping by DNA type. However, they are not mandated to report it at field two resolution. But the problem comes because of the fact that single antigen bead assays identify antibodies against HLA at field two resolution. But, because donor genotyping is mostly reported at field one resolution, this creates a challenge in the interpretation of HLA compatibility. Let's go with an example. Donor HLA is done by DNA typing, but because it is not, there is no mandate to report the HLA at field two resolution, a lab reports it as B44. Now the recipient single antigen B is at field two resolution. 
So it is reported as an antibody against B44O2 and B44O3. Now, without knowing whether the donor HLA is B44O2 or B44O3, it is not possible to determine whether this antibody that's present in the recipient is a DSA or not. Now, what about antigens that are, that are other than HLA? We all know about mica and anti-angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor antibodies also. So these antibodies that are non-HLA antibodies could be probably the prevalence of them could be more than what we, have, what we think the prevalence is. In addition to allo antibodies that HLA, mica, and this ABO uh, blood group antigen, we have several auto antibodies. Now, these days, they are still not commercially available, but several laboratories are trying auto antibody panels that are available using the same Luminex technology. How often to test for DNA after transplant? Now, this is controversial. Our center in highly sensitized patients, we try to do it every three months after transplant, at least for the first one to one and a half years, first 12 to 18 months. But how much or how frequent to test depends on the pre-sensitization, pre-transplant sensitization risk, as well as the cost involved. Now, finally, let's ask a question. So what if DSA develops after transplant? What is the big issue with that? The big issue with that is the slow deterioration of grad function and eventual grad failure. Now, transplant glomerulopathy is a condition that is due to chronic active antibody-mediated rejection. Patients who have donor-specific antibodies, whether it's a pre-transplant donor-specific antibody or a de novo antibody that's developed after transplant, over time, there is structural alteration in the kidney with results in gradually increasing creatinine glomerular and peritubular capillary endothelial cell basement membrane multilayering with the result that there is proteinuria and eventual grad failure. This is our own study here at Cornell where we studied 92 patients with transplant glomerulopathy or chronic antibody-mediated rejection. So I just want to draw your attention to two things here. One is that the patients who have this chronic active antibody-mediated rejection, their Prior history of acute rejection episodes is only about 25%, meaning that the vast majority of anti chronic antibody-mediated rejection who lose their grafts over time, this is a subacute or a chronic problem that's going on, not a progression from acute AMR. So it's not that every person who has a donor-specific antibody develops an acute graft dysfunction I do a biopsy, there is acute AMR, I try to treat it. The vast majority of them, there will be a slow deterioration in grad function. And again, when we, so, so far, no proper treatment protocols are available and people, I mean, and several groups are trying to come up with risk factors for identifying graft loss as well as to develop effective treatment strategies. But as of now, how to treat, what are the, what are the protocol when there is a subacute or a chronic deterioration in grad function is not yet clear. So I will stop here. Uh, there are still several aspects of donor-specific antibodies and the consequence of donor-specific antibodies that need to discuss. But for want of time, let me stop here and then I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Muthu. I think that was a very lucid talk on a rather difficult topic and I'm sure all the participants who have benefited a lot. It is very lucid. I just need two quick clarifications. If you can just state your name. Uh, one, of course, I understood that uh, at night when a disease donor comes to your hospital, uh, you are doing uh, for the donor only the field one. Am I right? You are not doing the field two. We are not, not doing field two. You are not doing field. You are doing field one. But that's fine. Now my query is that. You said that, you know, go back to what you said, that naturally occurring anti-HD antibodies do not occur. So that would mean that in a male without a previous transplant, without uh, blood donations, you wouldn't ever have uh, uh, these preformed antibodies. But then they do have, and that's why we do test. So can you just clarify this dichotomy? 
I mean, from where are they getting these antibodies? So these antibodies that were detected once the single antigen bead assays came into routine practice in, say, in a Caucasian male who has never had a blood transfusion or any issues before. So these are real antibodies. But what are these antigens that these are seeing? These are all cryptic antigens that are not going to happen within the circulation. But these antigens are being picked up once they are coated on the beads and these antigens are being exposed during that process. But how did I, let's say I have this antibody, how did I form these antibodies in my circulation initially? That's what they say, these are all probably, probably the word probably is used there, probably cross-reactive episodes, uh, cross-reactive epitopes against my, microbiota or against environmental proteins. So there are no significance in that case, so then why test at all in a white male who has never had a transplant or a transfusion? Why test it all? Because, because to finally, so in vitro, when you are checking them, there are no significance in vivo. But in order to know them, these are really, these are really uh, cryptic, these are antibodies against cryptic antigens and not an in vivo pathogenic antigens. There may be problem in finalizing the cross-match result before allocating an organ. Okay. Let's so say I'm that not... I'm waiting for a transplant and I'm being screened. And if I have some, say an MFI value of 3000 and tomorrow I get a kidney, somebody needs to determine that this is real antigen versus not a real antigen. So that, is, that cannot, so the, the cross match results cannot be finalized unless beforehand I made sure and as a recipient, somebody is writing in my chart that no, Mutu in serial for DSA analysis, he has antigen against A2. And this A2, this antigen that we are seeing is probably a cryptic antigen. Tomorrow, if I get an A2, go ahead. So that information should be available. Okay. And one last question. Uh, so in your lab at night, are you going ahead only with a virtual cross match or are you also doing a CDC before giving the recipient a graph? What percentage? Madhu will be in a better position to answer that. I think their center sort of they close their eyes and don't even wait for cross match, the physical cross match and go ahead. Our lab types for their institute. So we know what is happening there. Most of the, not most of the centers, a significant proportion of our centers, including our own, when the DSA, when the single antigen bead assay is clean, we go ahead with the transplant. But legally that issue is still not sorted out by what is mandated there needs to be a cross, the final cross match that, that has to be done at the center. Because this, this mandate was written in the time when virtual was not available, one can interpret that stating that this final cross match is a physical cross match. But because that's like a gray area, several centers are going ahead, but most of them are doing their physical cross match in the background. So in other words, we are not waiting for the results of the physical cross match but going ahead based on the single antigen bead results. But once the transplant is done, then physical cross match result is also available. Madhu, can you clarify on that? Yes, I think we have gone through two major transitions in the last couple of years. One is from in-person talks to virtual talks and physical cross matches to virtual cross match. So uh, you can see that the virtual talk works, uh, you know, as good or even better than the in-person talk at times. You know, it's, it's really nice and uh, well done these days. And the virtual cross match, unfortunately, is not as uh, well, uh, you know, deciphered. Um, and the, you know, the the caveats, you know, one of the first questions that came in the chat box is, you know, the sensitivity, specificity, and pitfalls of uh, Luminex assay. As you can see, there are many, and it's an evolving field, and that's why these, you know, uh, talks which gives you the latest information as well as the lack of information uh, is very important. Um, what we do is, you know, uh, when we have um, a patient who hasn't had any sensitizing events, and we have a sample at uh, the immunogenetics lab within two months, and we look at the antigen, uh, uh, you know, at the maximum level of, uh, you know, clarity that the donor center can give us. We look at the antibody panel and go ahead with the transplant if there are no major DSAs. And uh, so that's that's what we will do. And we, if there is high PRA in the recipient, we would send a physical cross-match sample and wait for the cross-match 
we can always uh, you know watch more closely for an antibody mediated rejection early on uh, you know post transplant and do what is necessary and even consider an early biopsy um, if if required so and also the virtual cross match is sometimes you know uh, the coordinator on call at night is, uh, you know, uh, tired and they're going through all these antibody panels working on multiple cases. So the virtual cross match sometimes takes a little bit of time and headache to decipher from the reports. But thankfully, we are we have such an expert immunogenetic center with, uh, you know, Muthu and uh, other members of his team running it. And so we have access to such knowledge and, uh, you know, they, they have the answers at their fingertips when, you know, we are at a loss. So that that's you know that's a big advantage we have, which I know that many centers don't have. So a couple of more questions from the in the chat box, which I want to you know bring to Muthus for a clarification. One is, you know, a question about how to detect epilepsy. Okay, so epilepsy detection comes from high resolution typing and uh, sort of a, there is a software known as HLA Matchmaker. So, which uses uh, computer algorithms to generate the epilet matching. So that was developed by an uh, by uh, somebody from University of Pittsburgh, and uh, probably that's going to be the future where uh, you can go to a level of epilet matching. And already, as you know, there are papers that say that epilet matching is probably better. Um, I want to ask, uh, you know, relay a question by a wonderful uh, beloved teacher, Dr. Gupta. He says, wonderful talk, made it so simple. A patient has a CDC negative, but flow cross match positive, but patient cannot afford single bead assay. What is the alternative in such a case to help the patient? Okay, so patient cannot afford sing, uh, Luminex. Probably, uh, again, some, Some more details about the history is needed. Let's say this is a patient with lupus. First step is probably to do an auto. Uh, so to make sure that these are not all at auto antibodies. And if, they are, if there are no antibodies, if they are sure that this is an allo antibody, then probably the, uh, the channel shift. How much is the flow positive? Remember that when we say flow positive, this is not a clear black and white. So what is flow positive? You have a signal. And then you allow the antigen, uh, you have the antibody to combine it with the cell. When there is a, when you, let's say again, uh, let me go to my example. My cells are taken, my, my serum is taken and it is added. And let's say there is an antibody combining. So there is a shift in the fluorescent signal. This shift, you put a line at a particular level and say that this is your median channel fluorescence and your median channel shift. So several labs have different criteria for that. Say for our lab uses a channel shift of 40 to call it as positive. So then we need to determine whether it is 41 channel or 100 channels. Even 41 channel is positive. 100 channel is also positive. It's like saying that if more than 120 is hypertension, 180 is also hypertension, 130 is also hypertension. So a sort of a clinical decision has to be made that, okay, this is only a slight channel shift Maybe I will go ahead and see what happens when there, when, when, when there is auto is negative. If it's a, definitely a 100 channel shift or a higher channel shift, then probably you cannot go ahead. Another question from Dr. Narulas. A multiple trans, blood transfuse recipient, CDC negative, flow negative, DSA cumulative MFI about 6,000 to 10,000. Is desensitization required? The question is, you know, whether you should go for individual MFI or, a, you know, cumulative MFI as a, you know, significant. Okay. So that again will be difficult to answer because the, the HLA, there is no one direct answer there. Because I told about cross-reactive epitopes, what will happen is, let's say that three different antigens are expressing the same cross-reactive groups and I have one antibody, I can, it can get diluted. So if the multiple epitopes are due to cross-reactive, then that cumulative MFI is more important. Let's say that I'm reacting to antigen one, two, and three, and all those one, two, and three are shared epitopes. Then I'm having, let's, one is 2,000, one is 3,000, another one is 4,000 then against, these are all one epitope, but it is present in multiple antigens. But the cumulative MFI there is 9,000. That is different from saying that 
one antigen is completely different from another antigen is completely different from the third antigen. So it is difficult to answer in a straightforward way that if you go by cumulative or go by individual, it all depends on that cumulative is in a context of cross-reactive groups or it, these are all individual beats. So that's why close working with the, with the tissue typing lab is important and it is difficult. It's not like a standardized test, like a serum creatinine where you just take whatever the lab says as a gold standard. Many have used this, asked this question in different forms. What is the cutoff of DSA that you'll use for induction therapy and what kind of desensitization protocol you use? So you want to just allude to the, you know, the use and misuse yeah. of MFI cutoffs. Sure. So again, as I told, MFI is, uh, MFI is not a linear scale. So 1000 is not double of 500. It's a relative fluorescence, but it provides some information as a sort of a semi-quantitative assay. Now, uh, again, as I said, studies have shown that about 1,000 to 1,500 can be used as a reasonable agreement among uh, multiple laboratories. If you look at European papers, a French group have used 500. We use 2,000. Why? Because in US, we use what is known as proficiency testing. ASHI, or American Society of Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics, they send samples standardized samples to multiple labs and ask them to report. And based on whether we are reporting it correctly or not, depending on how other centers are reporting, our each lab is assessed. Now, based on that, we came up with a cutoff of 2000 and we have to change our uh, flow, I mean, your flow cytometry cutoff also to be on par with other labs to call positive or negative. Remember that this is not like, there is no gold standard here. You are not looking at, say, I'm growing a bacteria and culture. That is gold standard. I'm doing a, a card test. Now I'm comparing it with that gold standard. No, there is no gold standard here. So what is the difference between 1,500? 1,500 is absent, 2,000 is not absent. That is difficult to say. So as I said, most labs use anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000. Having done so many transplants where we also use uh, uh, CDC crossmatch and flow, approximately around 5,000 to 6,000 DSA, we get a flow positivity. And around about 9,000 to 10,000 MFI, we get CDC. So in terms of sensitivity, you need at least like about 9,000 to 10,000 MFA value for a, for a, in a single antigen beta say, to have a CDC positivity and about 4,000 to 6,000 in that range, around 5,000 to have a flow positivity. But again, as I said, this, is, you, this cannot be taken as for every, every antigen, this is like this, cross-reactive groups, several things come into play here. Now, what do we do for desensitization? Now, about 10 years before desensitization was quite popular in the sense that there is no other option available. Now with uh, donor swaps and uh, um, sort of, uh, you can put them in the, uh, in the chain where uh, the swap is possible. The concept of desensitization is slowly going down. Madhu, maybe you can expand on that. No, I, I you know, I agree with everything you have, you have said. Uh, you know, I, I, any day, you know, if you can, you know, de facto decrease the immunological risk without desensitization, uh, which will be, which, which is a much better option than desensitization. And there were a couple of questions on desensitization. There's a, another question, uh, interesting from uh, Shamnad. Uh, if virtual cross match is negative, how can we exclude non HLA antibodies without CDC? I think even CDC or uh, flow cannot exclude non HLA antibodies, as far as I, I can tell. Uh, Dr. Mutuma, you want to? Add to that. Yeah. So, in other words, if if uh, if CDC is positive and DSA is negative, then obviously because I said DSA is equivalent to for all practical purposes, it is equivalent to IgG HLA. There could be a non-HLA like your uh, angiotensin uh, AT2 receptors or like endo anti endothelial antibodies and other things. So, there at least, if you have that scenario and there is a real concern. Most of the time we say, okay, this is some technical issue. Your cross match is fine. Let's go ahead or something like that. But if cross match is a real concern and the DSA is negative, then 
as I said, we, we use the 3A approach, making sure that the beads are, first we really did a proper HLA typing on the uh, donor. The beads are really present. The antigen is present on the bead to make sure that I'm testing for what I'm supposed to test. So once we exclude all that, then there are options available that though not commercially available completely, there are certain labs like Hopkins and uh, UCSF that try to do non-HLA antibodies. There are both ELISA and Luminex techniques to do platforms to do non-HLA antibodies. So again, so this, uh, this is all coming in the context of that first transplant fails, you are going for a second transplant, the DSA is negative, trust match is positive, what to do. But when everything is negative, you go ahead with the transplant, still you are, as Madhu said, you are not excluding a non-HLA antibody. You can only pick up retrospectively, something happens bad, then you're saying that, okay, there is probably a non-HLA antibody. So the, the couple of questions from Dr. Raja Ramayandran. One is uh, a flow negative DSA positive uh, transplant versus uh, a flow positive DSA negative transplant. Which one will be uh, more, uh, with, which likely to have a more favorable outcome? Uh, I'm sorry, words, repeat, uh, repeat it again. Yeah, whether you would count on a flow a cross match negativity or a virtual cross match negativity as more significant because flow negative DSA positive cross match versus a flow positive DSA negative cross match. Which one is oh. uh, more favorable? Oh, I, I think in terms of, well, let me make this one more time clear. In terms of sensitivity, we are, talk, we are talking about DSA, Luminex technology, which is more sensitive. It picks up antigen. Whether that antigen is really pathogenic whether this antigen is clinically significant, we do not know. It is simply present. Flow is the next level where you are saying that I'm not only picking up antigen, but I'm finding antigens, I mean, finding antibodies that are binding to the antigen. Next, when you go to CDC, you are not only saying that I'm seeing antigen, these, I'm seeing antibodies, these antibodies are not only binding, but they are killing the cell. So obviously, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, CDC is a surrogate of what's going to happen in my body. If CDC is showing that the antibodies are killing the cells, then the same thing is happen, going to happen in the body. If I go ahead with the transplant, the antibodies are going to destroy my kidney for all practical purposes. Flow means that there are antibodies that will go and bind to my kidney, which may or may not create problem. Luminex, if it is present, it will only say there is, there is antibody present. It may or may not even go to the kidney. So obviously, a situation where your virtual cross match, meaning that your DSA is positive by Luminex, but flow is negative, is better than a situation where flow is positive. Good. There's, there's a question on... I think it's pronase testing. Is it? Is it that Raja? I you think it's prozone. Maybe you mean prozone, uh, Doctor uh, Raja. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want. Yeah, because that is probably a prozone. Yeah, pronase is a little more. Uh, I think let's not. We can talk about pronase separately. So prozone. What is prozone phenomenon? So, so in microbiology, we have all learned about prozone and postzone phenomenon. So what happens is when you have an immune complex. You, have, you need the right amount of antigen and antibody. When you have excess antibody, that's called a prozone phenomenon. And when you have an excess antigen, you have a postzone phenomenon. What is that? When you have an antigen antibody, when you do it an in vitro test, they bind and form a lattice. Its structure becomes big. So for that, you need the right combination to this chain to enlarge. If you have more antibodies, then this will not going to happen. And if you have more antigen, this is not going to happen. In a similar situation happens in, in, in scenarios when you do a flow cytom, I mean, when you do a, a Luminex testing. So what happens is you have an antigen, you have an antibody. Let's say you have an antibody that's binding there. An antibody binds to antigen. C1Q, which is the starting point for your classical complement cascade. It's like a six headed monster. It has six heads. So those six heads, is in fact, why C1Q is important to activate the antigen antibody complex and move forward is because 
using its six heads, it is able to link multiple antibodies and sort of create a positive feedback to make the reaction happen. So in vitro, if you have C1Q, this C1Q, the six-headed monster can come and bind to the antibody. When it binds to the antibody, remember that in a Luminex, how am I checking what is this MFI value? I'm adding a fluorescent labeled antibody that goes and binds to the antibody that's present there, the anti-HLA antibody. But if the anti-HLA antibody site is already bound by C1Q, my secondary antibody cannot go and bind. Let's explain, let me explain one more time. I have a HLA antigen. I have a HLA. I mean, I have a HLA antibody. So in a system, you have a bead where there is HLA antigen. My serum is added. My HLA antibody goes and binds. C1Q that's present is now not allowing the fluorescent labeled antibody to go and bind to my antibody to create signals. That's why you will have a low level of antibody. I mean, low level of signal. So even though my antibody is binding, because my secondary antibody that's fluorescent label is not going and binding to this complex, there is no signal. So this is known as a hook effect or a prozone effect. So in order to overcome that, or there can be other inhibitory factors also that is simply not allowing my secondary antibody to go and bind. To overcome that, you dilute the sample or do certain other things. One aspect is to dilute the sample. When you dilute that, you are diluting out the, the inhibitor that's present there, you're allowing the secondary antibody, which is fluorescent label to go and bind, and then there is fluorescent signal. So this is known as a prozone effect. So what does this mean? So whenever a lab, this is all happening at the background in the lab, whenever a lab reports or before reporting, they see that there is no antibody. They need to make sure that they did the right thing and there is no prozone effect. So one way of dealing with this, because calcium is important for this C1Q to bind, one way is EDTA treatment, where you chelate this calcium. So our lab, for example, routinely does EDTA in all serum samples. Someone has suggested uh, there should be separate beads for class one and class two. That will decrease the cost. I suspect they may be talking about doing a separate test for the uh, class one antibody versus class two antibody. Uh, do you want to comment anything on that, Dr. Mutukumar? Uh, I think Raja can comment on that because single antigen, there is no issue with that. So, uh, I can, Dr. Madhu, can you please uh, uh, repeat the question once, please? So, Dr. Manish Kumar Singla says, why can't companies make separate class one and class two kits? It will lower the test cost by 50%. So, maybe it's given as a package, you know, they will do the whole antibody instead of just class one or class two separately. Indeed, uh, I think uh, the companies do market it as class one and class two separately. And we have the lab which only test for class one separately and class two separately and also club them together. So it is available indeed. It's That's how it's rep uh, reported also. Class one and class two. You know, you have the same sequence. Now, one way I can interpret that question is instead of doing single antigen, let's rephrase the question. Instead of sing single antigen B, now, because the vast majority of transplant patients are going to have going to have negative, no antibodies, why waste money on single antigen B? Can we simply do a class one as one test and class two and another test? If class one is positive, then go to single antigen B. That's the approach that labs in US used like maybe like 10 years or 12 years before. But now because the single antigen B cost has come down, Practically, they have abandoned that and it's it's gone to single antigen beads. Again, an analogy is that when COVID numbers were coming down, they started clubbing the samples. If 10, 10 swabs are being done, you put all 10 to 10 in one PCR and if that's all negative, you throw them out as negative. Then if, if one batch is positive, then pick up that 10 and do a separate PCR on each of that. So you can, it's the same principle. So the last question on the chat, uh, you know, hopefully I haven't missed anybody else or if someone else asks a new question, we can pick it up. If one patient uh, worked up for a second transplant as anti-HLA antibody present against his own HLA, it's again complicated that the previous donor was his mother. So there are some shared HLAs. It looks like autoantibodies. 
from Karthik? Yeah, I mean, if it's going to be the mothers, I mean, it's it, these are going to be autoantibodies, so there is no problem there. The question comes in only when it is not a haplotype that's shared. Somebody else gave the kidney and I, my HLA DR4 and your HLA DR4 may not be similar. But if, if I get my HLA DR4 by, from my mother, that's all going to be the same because I'm inheriting that as a haplotype. But if, if I simply have a cadaver transplant or a disease donor transplant, and that's DR4, there can be polymorphisms. And as I said, the field levels can be different. That's where your next field level comes in. If I'm having antibody against DR4, there are two DR4s available for me as donors, uh, disease donors. My antibody is probably DR4 patient one, not against DR4 donor two. So that's where your field two level comes in. Okay, another question know. has come up. Sorry. Um... Difference between flow CPRA and uh, single antigen bead CPRA. Let me also ask uh, a, an added question to that. We had uh, some patient who, you know, sent for a PRA and they said huge amount of background, they can't do a PRA. And what do you do in such a situation? Huge amount of background in PRA? Luminex PRA. Uh... Yeah, I mean, like when background is an issue, I think uh, the best option is to, I mean, again, that, that, that will be probably be too technical to answer these questions. One, we need to make sure that your controls are fine. There are no issues with the beads. And if nothing works, then probably it's better to repeat the sample. Is there an advantage of doing flow to your flow yeah, CPR? I'll come, mother, give me one minute. So there is something called as pan DR reactivity. Sometimes what happens is, uh, due to certain way the beads are arranged, you will have DR positivity for all uh, DRs in the beads. So in certain situations when somebody has a 100% CRA or CPRA, meaning that you have antibodies practically against everything, we need to make sure that this is not a pan DR reactive. So there are certain situations where you will have antibodies against every bead. That is your increased background versus a person with 100% CPRA there, you can make certain distinguishing features. Say, for example, if I'm having antibodies against my own HLA, then these are all part of pan PR reactivity, for example. So that you sort of throw it out, either go ahead or repeat another sample with another bead set. Whereas if I, if I have antibodies against multiple specificities, but if I don't have against my own, then it means I'm dealing with a true antibody where I'm producing antibodies against multiple antigen specificities. Dr. Muthu, I have just one question. What is the current status of C1Q binding DSAs? Are you doing it routinely or is it only on studies uh, and your comments regarding that? No, we are not doing C1Q. Again, after that Alex Lupi's paper in New England Journal, there was a big uh, push towards C1Q. But C1Q probably, one, there are some technical issues. Two, it is probably a surrogate for higher MFI values of DSA and it, it may not be a truly pathogenic. So I don't think most of the labs are doing C1Q. Yeah, in fact, Alex Luby said his own center is not doing it. Yeah, he's, he himself is not doing it. Request comment on Luminex, Luminex lysate method of cross-match using donor lysate for cross-matching used frequently in India and not sure about its standardization. How sensitive or specific is that? Yeah, I think Raja should answer. I have this question comes up, but unfortunately, I'm not qualified to answer that question. Oh, come on, uh, Raja. You shouldn't be saying that. Um, see, it's uh, even in PGI, uh, initially, there were reports of uh, the uh, lysate methods being tested. So what actually happened is I think some of it is not a standardized technique one. And it seems that, uh, you know, this many of these kits were being provided free of cost by the company. So that was a main pushover for, you know, doing these tests. In uh, PGA, at least we have given up uh, doing a lysate test and we no more do this lysate and we don't interpret it clinically at least. Yeah, I think Raja is absolutely right and that's what it should be. Although, as he said, it was given, given freely, so I think many were using it, but I don't think it should be used. Yeah, totally agree with Raja. Uh, I think we need to conclude now, I think, because it's been a long time and... Uh, 
present questions, so we can send email to Dr. Muthu, and I think we'll be happy to answer them. It was an excellent yeah. talk, I think. I, we all learned a lot. We made so many complicated things so easy. And I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Madhu, for being around and uh, really moderating this. Thank My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Thank you. thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bomik sir, and thank, thank you, Madhu. And yeah. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you so thank much. You. It was the first, uh, you know, invited series talk, and I think we have had hundred minutes. You have spoken hundred minutes. I think only a politician can match you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. 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 Uh, Roy, just stop the recording.